Hello everyone, welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 14 verse 8 is where we left off, and I've got some unfinished business in that verse, so we'll pick it up. In Revelation chapter 14 verse 8, get your Bible, open it up so that you can follow along. We're in the last book of the Bible in this current series going through the New Testament. And so this is how it will all end. And it's going to get rough, but then it's going to get great. And God tells us all about it in the book of Revelation. And you can study the entire Bible with me, which I would really recommend. Genesis through Revelation at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com. Study through the whole Bible with me. Almost four complete series at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. And all you need to bring is your Bible. Click and listen, and you're all set. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation 14, verse, um, yeah, verse 8. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. There's a lot of angelic activity that will be visual to the world coming up in the final days of this planet before Jesus returns. Last time we saw an angel flying throughout the entire world preaching the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ, giving people an opportunity to repent, even in the midst, in the midst of all of God's judgment. And here, this angel has an announcement that Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Babylon represents the world that excludes God from its life. It is talking about people in general who are consumed with work, play, sports, entertainment, this and that, everything and anything, and give little or no thought to God. Certainly, no regards to him and no thought of pleasing him at all. They don't give Jesus, I was going to say a second thought, they don't give him a first thought. They're too busy with all their stuff to give serious thought to repentance, to even being concerned about their immortal soul. They're not interested in repentance and receiving Christ as Lord and Savior. Many people burning in hell right now were hard-working, hard-playing people who simply never made time for Jesus. And then some sorry feel-good preacher who doesn't even know Christ himself says a few words at their funeral to try to make everyone feel good. You know, Mr. So-and-so, I'm sure he's looking down from heaven. He's home at last in the comforting arms of God. No sorrow, home at last, home at last. The little funeral cards, they usually say stuff like that too. And why, according to Reverend Feelgood, is Mr. So-and-so in heaven? Well, because he worked hard. And because he had so many friends, of course. Meanwhile, the dead man is burning in hell because in spite of his productivity and in spite of all of his friends, he never repented and made a commitment to Christ. 
which was the one big thing he needed to do. That's what Babylon pictures. It pictures a life that excludes Christ, a busy life, and in some ways, an entertaining life, a very busy life, though, that excludes Christ and ends up in hell. Verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the mark of the beast. We hear a lot of sensational talk about the mark of the beast. Books have been written, millions have been made by people purveying all sorts of ridiculous and foolish suggestions as to what this is. Let me tell you what it is, and I'm not going to charge you 25 bucks for a book. The mark of the beast symbolizes a commitment to sin, a commitment to Satan, and a rejection of Jesus Christ. The mark of the beast cannot be taken in, a, in an accidental way. You cannot be tricked into taking the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast during the end times will be given in conjunction with the rejection of Christ. If you reject Jesus Christ, we'll give you this mark, and then you can buy, sell, and trade. You can have health care. You can go to work. You can drive a car. But you must renounce Christ to take this mark. The mark of the beast is just the outward symbol of a rejection of Jesus Christ. It's to show everybody else that you have rejected Christ, which will be the popular way to go. It is today, but it will be extremely popular before Jesus returns. So the mark of the beast, you can, some people are saying, no, this is the COVID era. And some people were afraid. Some Christians were make absolute fools out of themselves, refusing to take the vaccine, suggesting that it might be the mark of the beast. And if you take the vaccine, you're going to go to hell. My Lord, what pitiful Bible teacher are you sitting under to come to that unbiblical conclusion? I'm not here to promote the vaccine or, or to unpromote it. That's neither here nor there. But it's stupid to think that you can be tricked into taking the mark of the beast by taking a vaccine or tricked in any other way into taking the mark. You can't. It's not about having something in your body or on your body. That's irrelevant. It's what's in your heart. And if you reject Jesus Christ, that's the issue. That's what sends you to hell. Not a tattoo. Not an implant. Rejecting Christ is what sends you to hell. It is a commitment to sin, a commitment to Satan, and a rejection of Christ. That is the mark of the beast. And what happens to those who refuse to turn from their sin and refuse to receive Christ? What happens to them? Well, look at verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. That is a description of hell. What you just saw in these two verses is hell described under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's hell. Torment. 
torment in fire nonstop forever and ever. I don't care what the devil offers you. I don't care how much you how much fun you have committing your sin. And I don't care how nice it feels to be accepted by the multitude of people who reject Christ. It doesn't matter. None of it. Not even all of it combined is worth eternal torment with fire in hell. If someone thinks it's worth it, well, I guess that's their choice. But God tells us these things in the hopes that, that, we, that we are smart enough, wise enough to know it isn't worth it and avoid it as a result. Verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In other words, it may be harder. It may, be, it may call for sacrifice in this life to remain faithful to Christ. But if that's what it takes, it's better than going to hell. God never said that being saved from hell would be easy in this life. 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. The reward for being a Christian is not in this life. It's not your best life now, as that heretic has been known to say in that his title of his book. It's, it's not your best life now. It's only your best life now if you're going to end up going to hell. And I won't comment any further on that. Don't need to. But the reward, according to Holy Scripture, for being a Christian is heaven. God says, blessed is the Christian who what? Who dies. Not blessed is the Christian who belongs to the word of faith nonsense and repeats the mantra of whatever it is that they want in this life and, and think that that form of witchcraft is going gonna, is gonna to be sanctioned of God and that it has anything in the world to do with faith. God doesn't say, blessed are you if you repeat your fleshly desires over and over again. It says, blessed is the Christian who dies. Take whatever good God gives you in this life for sure. If you're a Christian, take it, enjoy it. But don't be shocked if it's not smooth sailing. God has never promised Christians health, wealth, and everything nice in this life. Those false teachers in that heretical word of faith movement promise health and wealth to Christians if they only have enough faith. And the reason those preachers are constantly saying, God told me this, or I had a vision, or I have a new revelation from God. God showed me something that he's never showed anybody else. I had a vision. I have a word from the Lord. I sense in my spirit. The only reason they always say that kind of stuff is because they can't possibly back their teaching from Scripture. Not rightly divided. The only thing good that God has promised faithful Christians is eternal life or heaven as opposed to eternal hell. 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat, like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. This pictures Jesus in the sky at his return, wearing a crown and holding a sickle. So notice verse 15, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, 
and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the grapes of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horses' bridles, by the space of two thousand and six hundred furlongs. This vision pictures Judgment Day. On that day, Jesus Christ gathers the wicked who have rejected his mercy, refuse to repent, and he crushes them. And by the time Jesus is finished with them, they look like grapes that have been trampled until there's nothing left but a shell. The juice is gone. The insides are gone. Judgment Day will be, on, will be beyond horrible for people who refuse to repent and ask Jesus Christ to save them. Jesus will return as judge, not Savior, and he will crush the life out of those who have rejected his mercy. On that day, it's going to be too late to avoid death and hell. On that day, when you see Jesus returning, it'll be too late to do anything about it. And people won't be able to do anything about it, and they won't even try. They'll just cry for the rocks and the hills and the mountains to fall on them and to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. It'll be too late to avoid death and hell. But it's not too late today. If you repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior, You'll be forgiven, and you will avoid God's holy wrath described in these verses. Chapter 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels, heaven the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Once sin has run its course and sinners who refused God's mercy are in hell. God's wrath will be a thing of the past. Never again for all eternity will God ever be angry again. The only thing that makes God angry is sin. So once sin and impenitent sinners are removed, God's angry will, anger will be gone forever. Verse 2, And I saw as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. So verse 2 pictures happy Christians in heaven. They're happy because they persevered with Christ until the end. They're happy because they didn't give in to the world, into peer pressure. They didn't love their life even unto death. They loved Jesus more. They wanted to go to heaven. They wanted to avoid hell more than anything else. They didn't give in to the world. They didn't give in to the devil who tried to lure them away from Jesus. But they wouldn't take the bait. They rejected short-term comfort and long-term hell in favor of short-term discomfort and long-term happiness. And boy, are they ever glad that they did because here's a picture of it all. It's all over 
and they're in good shape. And again, I say to you, as I have said many times since we began this book, that's, that's why the book of Revelation was given by God to tell his people, it's going to get rough. I never promised you an easy time here on earth. And it's going to get rough and it's going to get worse before Jesus returns. But hang in there because in the end, you're the winner and they're the loser. Verse 3. Still a picture of these Christians who persevered. They're in heaven and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Christians in heaven are heard telling God, just and true are your ways. Today, we do not always see things clearly. If we are honest, I think we would admit that we sometimes wonder why the good things that we want so badly and pray for do not come to pass. Today, believing that God is just is a matter of faith because in this world, justice does not always prevail. But when we are in heaven, when this life is over, when sin has run its course and sinners are punished and we're in good shape and everything is wonderful, we'll look back and we will understand why things had to happen the way they did. On that day, we will understand why God said no to some of our prayers. On that day, we will understand why we experienced so much loss and so much pain. Today, Christians believe that God knows what he is doing by faith. In eternity, we will see as God sees and we will understand that God did things the way he had to do them and that he knew what he was doing all along. With perfect hindsight, we will say, God, knowing what I know now, if I had to do it all over again, I never would have doubted you or uttered one single complaint. Four, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. Everyone in heaven worships the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who say all religions worship the same God, just different names, are wrong. And that sounds so nice doesn't it? And it sounds so sophisticated and so intelligentsia and so tolerant. It just sounds so good. But it's a big lie. It simply isn't true. The God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is completely, totally different from Islam's Allah. They have absolutely nothing in common. And he's not anything like the Hindu gods, which number in the millions. He's not like he's any, he's not anything like the, the Jesus of the Bible is not anything like the Mormon Jesus or the Jehovah Witness Jesus. They're not anything alike. They're different. And are you ready for this? Different things are not the same. And the fact is, Jesus is the focus of people in heaven because he's the only way that anyone gets there. But they're not the same. Allah's not the same as Almighty God. They're, they're completely different in what they demand. 
and their attitude toward people and their attitude toward evangelism. They're completely different. The Jesus of the Mormons, the Jesus of the Jehovah Witnesses, the Jesus of the cults are completely different than the Jesus revealed in Holy Scripture. For that matter, the Jesus of modern evangelicalism is different from the Jesus in Scripture. All you got to do is compare them to what the written Word of God says. You see how different they are. And so they're not the same because different things are not the same. Now, verse 5. And after that, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breast girded with golden girdles. And one of the four living creatures gave unto the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. The Bible says that judgment is, is God's strange work. In other words, God does not like to punish sinners. He would, he would much rather avoid it. Which is why he became a man, a human being. Gave up omnipresence. Which is why the Son of God, who was the eternal Son of the eternal Father, confined himself to a human body and still is at the right hand of God the Father. It's why he gave up the privileges of deity. The Son did, came to earth, lived a sinless life, worked with his hands, got blisters, got cuts, probably hit himself in the thumb with a, with a hammer as he did his carpentry work, probably got a lot of slivers, got tired, worked hard, ministered for three years doing more miracles than can be numbered, was abused by human beings, falsely accused, arrested, flogged, nailed to a cross, died, and paid for our sins. You know why he went all through that? Through all that? You know why he shed great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified? He was under so much pressure and he went through with it anyway. You know why he did all that? Because judgment is God's strange work. People say, I believe God is love. He won't punish sinners. You believe in a fairy tale. Not the part that God is loved. He's already proven that he's love by doing what I just described. But he will punish sinners because he is a God of justice. It's his strange work. He doesn't like to punish. He's done everything that he possibly can to avoid punishing sinners. He's given you the opportunity to repent and receive eternal life through Jesus Christ as a gift. He hates to do it. He will. He must because he is just, but he'd rather not. And notice in verse 5, God is preparing to pour out his wrath on sinners. And as he does, notice, he removes everyone from his temple in heaven. It's as if God wants to be alone as he sends his angels to punish this rebellious world once and for all. The big finish. We'll begin to see this next time. Make sure you join me. In chapter 16. You want to be a part of this ministry, this faith ministry, and help me get out the Word of God? Then pray for me and pray for God's Word. And when you take a break from studying at the BibleVerseByVerse.com, click the donate button at the top of the front page and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. See you next time.